Yes, yeah, so, so it's all crypto now. Okay. Like, I think because we got in so early, it was a really, really not particularly competitive market. So it was, it was just us. The market was tiny and we always thought this market's going to go somewhere. Welcome back to another episode of the Recruitment Mentors podcast. I'm your host, Isha Mazuz. And on this week's episode, I was joined by the founders of Plexus, Sean and Zeth. Crypto is kind of mature. There's little pockets of interest a lot of the time. It has cycles in the same way that traditional markets have cycles, except the cycles are infinitely more aggressive. <laughs> There's now just over 30 of them. They've broken the 4 million GP mark. And we really sat down and discussed how they've gone about that. What have been the, the three biggest mistakes you guys have made? I think... Um how they've cultivated their culture, how they've built their leadership team, uh, and what the plans are for the future. I think the, the short-term goal is to like grow and grow in crypto. I think for anyone that has aspirations to scale their recruitment business. Most of the people that we have in for interviews are like pretty excited about the space. They're pretty interested in it, like some more so than others. For anyone that finds themselves always leveling out at 10 heads, 15 heads, 20 heads, this is gonna be really insightful for you if you really wanna break past that barrier and get to 30 plus. Enjoy the episode. Sean Zeff, welcome back to the podcast. Yes. Hello. Hello. Bit different. <laughs> It is. This is high level. You've <laughs> upped your game big time. Obviously, same. Obviously, why I want to sit down with you guys. There's a few people that, yeah, really. Uh, hopefully, at some point, we'll be able to get sit back down with. I think people are always curious about hearing people's stories uh, on the podcast, and then them talking about where they want to go, and then finding out if they actually got there. Yeah, and put you guys in that category. So obviously, when we sat down, uh, it was in your old Waterloo office. Uh, I think we just had like a meeting room, didn't we? Yeah, it was a bad office. Yeah, no, it wasn't that bad. It was all right. <laughs> it was all right. I okay. it was all right. Obviously, you're now in, uh, <laughs> I've been to your, obviously, office in London Bridge, which I think is mega. Yeah. But it's I know better. you're looking at another office now. We are. Um, so, yeah, just really excited to ultimately unpack the last three years. So, just to frame it up for everyone, and Sean, if I get anything wrong, tell me. Okay. <laughs> we can correct people. <laughs> so, when we last sat down, which was uh, April 2020, um, there was 13 of you in the business. Um, I think you was coming towards the end of your third year in business and, and the main goal that you had was to break the million GP mark, which you did. You did 1.05, which we were just talking about before this, in your third year of business. And then uh, the financial year just gone, you ended uh, on 4.6 uh, GP, 4.6 million uh, GP. So obviously over the last three years, that's what we've got up to and there's just over uh, 30 of you in the business now. Uh, and then... Uh, again, correct me if I'm wrong. Obviously, the year just gone, you did around 90% perm, 10% contract. Mm -hmm. Is that fair? Yep. And then when I was listening back to the podcast, you did way more contract before, right? Yeah. What was the split then when we last sat down, do you think? Because it, it was many contracts, I felt like you yeah, said. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was probably about 60-40 to contract. Really? Okay, mm -hmm. cool. Right, so let, we'll, we'll talk about that. So purpose of this, and for everyone listening, we're going to talk about this journey which you've gone on. A lot of recruitment companies that I speak to struggle to break the the ceilings of 15, 20 people, get past that. It's a really difficult period and you've been in the thick of this and I know that you're trying to push this on uh, again now. So that's what we're going to break down. But I guess just to kick start this, Sean, I'm going to come to you first. Would love just to hear your take because this might have changed or evolved just with how the market's been, the different people that we have in the industry now or entering the industry. Like what do you believe are the common characteristics and traits that uh, successful recruiters uh, possess in today's market or have to possess in today's market? Yeah. So I think um, when we spoke last time, I think uh, I mentioned that I think resilience is is always one of the most important things like good recruiters can, can have. I think that's evolved a little bit. I think these days, like, it's a combination of skill set and mindset, really. And, you know, you can, you can try and train and develop both, but I, I guess mindset is probably more, like, inherent to somebody's personality a little bit. Um, I think that's the two most important things. If you especially for us like we try to combine that with market knowledge that's a big thing for us um i think if you can put those three things together then you you should be a pretty successful recruiter love that zeph what we're saying uh similar to sean i'd probably say like uh like likability mm -hmm. i think you know you're in sales i think you, as a salesperson i always say good salespeople don't sound like they're selling and half of that i think is being likable and mm -hmm. trustworthy i think like the resilience and the work ethic i think goes without saying but I think if you're likable and engaging and, and you'll come across as more trustworthy, and generally I think you'll probably do better. Yeah, fair. So I think what would also be useful for people then, so uh, we were just talking a bit about what both of you, in terms of 
what you've ended up focusing on, what your responsibilities have been between you. I think that'll just be useful framing for people. So again, if I get anything this wrong, let me know. But we put down, so Zef, you found yourself over the, I don't know what period this is, maybe the last 12 months, last six months, I don't know. But for you, you'll find yourself more managing, like being in more of like a sales manager, managing of the 360 function and very much more on the sales floor. Mm. Right? That yeah, yeah, no, it's fair, yeah. I'm sure there's other things you're doing, but yeah. And then Sean, you, you're the ops guy, mate. <laughs> yeah. Not I'm, by I'm, choice. No. <laughs> the reluctant ops guy, yeah. <laughs> the reluctant uh, uh, ops guy. So so let, let's just first, like, who you, either of you can share with me, but fair to say you guys committed to the crypto space. Mm. I, th- have you continued to commit to it over the last three years? Because when I was listening back to the podcast, I think, Zeph, you were saying, like yeah, we've we've always done this, but we like the idea of having different pillars. If that's cloud, if it's <laughs> architecture, whatever. So, but I feel like outside looking in, uh, when I think of you guys, I think you guys as one of the sort of early people that really committed to that blockchain crypto space. And as I'm sure you guys would be more aware than me, I think more and more people have, have popped up right to focus on that. Yeah. But over the last three years, is it fair to say that? most of your business or all of your business you just focused on that being your niche yes yeah, so, so it's all crypto okay. like i think we realized that because we got in so early it was a really really like not particularly competitive market so it was, it was just us the market was tiny and we always thought this market's going to go somewhere but it's it has cycles in the same way that traditional markets have cycles except the cycles are like infinitely more aggressive (laughs) and i think when we spoke to you last like we were still in like a pretty heavy bear market and there was like a lot less than this bear market so Mm. i think if you look at maybe market caps of crypto i think back then it was maybe three maybe two three hundred billion now in in the pit of a bear market it's 1.4 trillion Mm. so it's it's a huge market It's, it's probably at the point where it's and i don't want to curse and stuff but too probably too big to fail now yeah and so it doesn't make sense for us to like spread ourselves so thin. Like we go all in on crypto, everyone does crypto and then we can dominate the market or have a larger market share because we have so many people all focusing on the same goal and the same market and stuff. So we're all crypto. I think longer term, do we look at maybe other brands? Possibly. I think the the short term goal is to like grow and grow in crypto. And what, how would you describe the market currently then? The markets, the markets, uh, I mean, our crypto bear market or downturn started way before like the traditional economy got hit. And so it's been uh, probably last May was probably when it started to to drop and drop pretty aggressively. And when it Mm. drops, like clients panic. And what does that actually look like in the recruitment sense? Is that, Seth, we we planned on hiring, not doing any of that anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What does that actually look like? It it looks like an absolutely rammed jobs board, just like, (laughs) just etching off one after the other. I mean, this, like, I mean, don't don't get me wrong, there's still plenty out there. I say say to a lot of our guys, I think the crypto market is, when it was crazy, it was super crazy. And I think when it's, when it's like in a bear market like this, there's still jobs. You just have to like mm. work harder to find them. Like it's, it's there's still very much a market, and then the guys still do like quite a bit of business and stuff. So, you know, I think a lot of people compare it to traditional tech markets, but most of our guys, because they're graduates, have only ever worked in a crypto recruitment job, mm. so they don't know what it's like working in other markets. And what what's the current story then that we're telling the people like our. Oh, like keep working through this and there's it just goes through cycles or like there are still success stories in a bear market i mean it's it's no it's no different from like a traditional like tech company like there'll be people who are doing really really well in the bear market some of my best years before plexus were in bear markets or bad markets in Mm. in tech and so you can just apply that same logic to to crypto it's just more aggressive okay i think what we found last time was like 2018 19 like that sort of bear market period it was like it was dead Mm. Like it was it was pretty dead um whereas now there's like within because crypto is kind of matured there's little pockets of interest a lot of the time so whilst overall it might be like the market might have softened a little bit there's there's little sort of pockets of interest around like different layer twos that are popping up or maybe like nfts are hot for a period mm. or stuff like that so if you're good then you you're, you're still able to find like little opportunities within that even in like quite a maybe a slightly quieter market than it was before and then uh either of you chip in on this but what just because i think it'd be relevant like how i think it be, could be really easy for anyone in your business and anyone that maybe you potentially interview just to be really uh sucked into like all the negativity like online 
the news because I do feel like that's on like steroids with crypto. I feel like almost mm. just because I don't know. There's just so much to it in terms of how many sort of uh, of like whatever you want to call it the old guard traditional infrastructure are all still very much against it or like there's just so much more to it. Whereas I think if you're in a, a typical market right now, whether that be a tech market or just different markets, there's still some negativity. But it's probably a bit more easier to just focus on the things that you can control and not let all of that infiltrate like your your uh, mindset. How how have you gone about protecting that for the guys or helping people with that? Because I feel like it th yeah they could just be full of negativity all the time and just say yeah well, crypto's tanked it's done I don't know because I feel like it's way more I think intense. That, those people generally don't apply to work for us. I <laughs> yeah. guess like most of the people that we have in for interviews are like pretty excited about the space. They're pretty interested in it. Like some more so than others. Mm. Um, but you guys must be more on it though in terms because I feel like I was I was I always like to look at uh, when I interview people what they've been posting online and stuff like that if there's things that I can get them to talk about. But I think like. Sean, when I was looking at your content, like you're always talking about just market commentary. Mm. So I feel like with your space, you, you've probably had to continue to be d probably a, an extra 25, 30% more doing that with your team than maybe if you was in like a typical engineering market. I, d I just feel, I don't know, I might mm. be wrong. I don't know if you've, how you've communicated to the team, like this is what we're hearing, this is what's going on. You've had to really over communicate that because they could all very easily go, yeah, the, we're done. Mm. I think, yeah, it's, I don't know, it's not really a challenge that we've had, is no, it? Yeah, it is. Yeah, I, I mean, mean I, so, uh, like, I, they're, they're, because people invest in crypto and you mm. can make money, there's a lot of people who are interested in it. And so, naturally, it gets a lot of clicks when you post about it. So, there just is more news about it. Like, mm. there isn't mainstream news about, I don't know, uh, you know, the new version of Python or something like mm. that. Like, people just aren't that interested. Whereas, if you've invested in something, you're interested. So, there's a constant like cycle of stuff that's coming through and so when you work in an office and there's like 30 people and we're all working in the same sector generally people talk about it anyway mm. and so it's not like you're in like just this media echo chamber where everything's amazing and then oh my god everything's tanking it's the worst and stuff it's more just a you know it, it's just it's just a market and we're all talking about it and it just continues to to roll irrespective of like really really great news or really really bad right, news yeah, so. Okay, nice. So, Sean, let me come to you on this then. I want to know, let's just start with, what have been the, the three biggest mistakes you guys have made since over the last three years? <laughs> Business-wise, uh, whatever, like, talk to us. What's been the three biggest mistakes? I think... Um, God. Uh, I, I, it's probably so, you, many, so many. There's just so many. <laughs> so many mistakes. Top of mind, come on. I think... <laughs> I, I think um, we're, and it's kind of annoying because we kind of saw it happening through the through the period. There's a, there's a period, and and this is not just crypto. This is like the wider tech recruitment in general. I think like over the last couple of years, uh, maybe up to sort of six nine months ago, like the market was super super buoyant, and, and recruitment companies doing really really well. Everybody's making lots of money. Um, I think our standards were slipping in that period mm. and it's really hard when you like look at a sales team you, you know you've got people who have only ever known one market so they've o they've only ever known good times they and they come into that and it's like great really easy to pull jobs like there's loads of interest in the space easy to easy to fill them great fees like this is easy mm. like no problem you know rock up uh, you know to work at nine o'clock in the morning chip off at sort of half five six and just you know and, and just and have a laugh and great happy days <laughs> like the recruitment that we knew as trainees was like you're in early you're on the tools it's hard you get a lot of rejection you're working late and you know and not everybody kind of makes it but you know when, when it was as good as it was it's it, it, it breeds complacency mm. and we knew for a we were like this is going to end like at some this is not going to last forever you know like at some point the market's going to turn we've already lived through like one crypto bear market we knew it was going to you know impact the hiring and stuff but like it's so hard to like communicate that to people that they, they just a lot of the time they have to live it themselves mm. um so i think like yeah it's just trying to like get people out of that sort of complacency period you know and uh, yeah that, that was probably tough yeah, I mean, I'm hearing that with so many people that I'm speaking to. Mm. Yeah, Not it wouldn't bad. surprise me. I think it's it's so it's so difficult to try and enforce um, certain standards when everyone's doing deals and everyone's mm. doing well, and it's been like, you know, wh why are you on my back about yeah. this? And it's just, I think me and him knew, and we knew probably for maybe six nine months that like it like the standard just wasn't there, the mm. like the quality of stuff we we're doing just wasn't there. But it was just really hard to like create change when everyone's doing deals and everyone's making really good money and mm. stuff like that but it doesn't surprise me to hear that other people have yeah no, the same definitely thing. so anything obviously with with these types of things there's always learnings i guess you won't know until you're in it but 
like because uh, yeah i think it'd be helpful for people would you change how you tried to approach getting on people's backs or could you have communicated it in a different way i don't know is there anything that you thought about that because i'm sure you'd be like right we want to make sure that we address this different next time that's yeah, difficult. We did try to address yeah, it. Yeah, we well. did. This is we thing. really did. Just like, we really just, did. So how did you? Yeah, they all just like how guys. Like, like shut up. Man. <laughs> 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 Everything's fine. <laughs> really? Yeah, so what? So much. you tried to attempt it to be like, hey guys, we've been in the game long enough. We know this isn't going to last. Yeah. If we we need to make sure that we keep the quality up, I know you're smashing deals, you're hitting your targets, but we need to really focus on quality and what they're going. What, well, we're doing that. I'm I'm hitting my target. Mm. So I think I think probably one thing like we were pushing on performance, right? And I think we we generally always been pretty good in terms of like having a bit of an attitude of like this is good, but we can do better. Mm. Uh, I think maybe a little bit more around like wider perception of like how our customers perceive us as mm. opposed to like just internal performance. Like that's a good insight. Yeah, and, and like maybe like we we have like an SLA with our clients where we have a two week turnaround. So we basically try and promote that we will box your job off in five working days. Mm. And we say to you, if we'll commit that to you, you commit to doing all your interviews in five working days. And so we could like, I say to the guys, I almost have like a conveyor belt mentality, job in, boxed, job off. Mm. And then you just manage like that, that interview process. I think towards the end that slipped mm. and because there was so much demand for talent and such a short supply of talent that Clients were just jumping at like mm. candidates that weren't that great, and so people were effectively being given a pass on people who probably were not as good as we should be sending. And so I think, in hindsight, maybe leaning more around how the clients and customers perceive us, and likewise the candidates as well. Other than what Zeph and Sean, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah that, that's a good insight. I think that's something that recruiters should be doing more of: getting actual feedback mm. from their customers. Mm. What What comes to mind, Zeph? Anything for you then? Se second biggest mistake. Second biggest mistake. <coughs> um, that's a tough one. Uh, I like. I think. Uh, I mean, this is an obvious one, but you know, we, you go through phases where you where you start hiring a lot of people, and you get into a viewpoint in terms of the sort of things that you're looking for, and those people maybe are good for recruitment, but they're not good for recruitment at Plexus. Mm. And I think knowing who you are as a company, what it is you're going to be asking people to come in and, and do, hiring based on your values and your culture rather than just can they do the job, like mm. are they are they good for the job type stuff. I think that's probably a mistake that we made, but maybe that wasn't more recent. That was quite a while back, but that was something we used yeah, to get. Part of the, the three years. Yeah. We're looking at the last three years. Yeah. I think I think we perhaps underestimated like the lead time and the planning around some of the non sales hires. I think when it comes to hiring salespeople, we've been doing it for, you know, uh, quite a while, a long time. And we're like, we know what we're looking for, we know what mm. works and what doesn't work. And we don't always get it right, but like I, I guess from a percentage point of view, we're like we're we're relatively good at it. Like uh, all the hiring of like non sales people, so like marketing and talent and operations <laughs> and those sorts of things, like it just takes like so much longer to find the the, the quality of people that that mm. we want. And I think mm. that's probably been a bit of a learning for why, us. Why do you think it? that is? Then is it because you're not sure is that entirely on what you want or what good looks like? I think knowing what good looks like a lot of the time is mm. yeah um, is difficult. Like we like and you know we we brought in um, an interim CMO to help us out with the marketing stuff and like and his view on like what what good looks like from marketing is often you know like different from from ours. Mm. Obviously, he's right. We're wrong. Right? He's <laughs> yeah. the expert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> so um, yeah. Yeah. So it's those types of things can can often take a, a longer time, or yeah, you end up massively. Maybe yeah, more often getting it wrong in line with what Zeph was saying. Maybe they don't add to the yeah. the culture or in line with that. So let let's talk about um, what a recruitment business looks like when it's double the size. It's generating um, yeah a lot more uh, revenue. Sean, what what does the actual infrastructure look like, or like what are you aiming for it to look like? Because I know there's still people that you're hiring for on these things. Mm. So, because I know obviously you guys have aspirations to continue to scale and grow. Mm. So it'd be good just to hear your take on like how you sort of visualize that, how it currently looks. So what I'm asking is, yeah, what does your, the leadership layer look like? How many managers have you got compared to salespeople? When you say the non-sales people, we talk in ops, we talk in marketing internal. Mm. Talk to us a bit about how you're trying to set up Plexus or what it looks like today. And then also some of the seats that you think are really important to get to the, the next stage. Yeah, so like where we were 
um, maybe like a year or, or yeah, a year or two ago is that hierarchy super flat. Mm. Me and Zeth still on the tools, like still managing day to day, still individually training people and manage, managing salespeople. Um, I'm sort of individually managing the sort of ops and finance and legal and all that sort of stuff as well. And um, it's, I, I think when we, we kind of had this like, period i guess like sort of last summer last sort of summer last autumn time where it was like right we we actually need more of a hierarchy we need more structure here like we can't individually manage we can just about individually manage a business of about like 25 30 people but beyond that it's going to be crazy trying to do that with like 50 or 60 people so we've had to like implement like loads more structure around uh around management for for sales and non-sales um like our job now is i guess manage or trying to manage probably like seven or eight nine people something like that i you know we don't want to be individually like managing every every single trainees and and i i guess our view now is like how can we how can we build to really scale like really aggressively over the next year or so how can we go from the current sort of 30 odd people that we are to 60 next year to 100 the year after that or well, we have to put the the structure in place to do that now um so what uh, does that look like what does that structure look like how are you currently thinking about it um I think it's difficult to say from a numbers point of view because we've always especially for like for, for salespeople we we really really want to hire we've hired a few seniors over the years but we really want to hire organically and train mm. people up and get people in the grads grad level and then and let them develop organically into into management because it gives the people um you know the best opportunity to progress in the business so but because of that there's obviously a lead time on, on, on how quickly you can managers do, and leaders exactly, exactly right because you just need a bit of you need a bit of experience um and we've, we've got people that have been doing it sort of you know two or three years getting into that now um for non-sales we've always been in the view that we want to hire really really high quality people we don't want an, an enormous kind of back office team or mm. or anything like that so i i think we probably want i guess um five or six sort of really really high quality sort of senior people who are non-sales based um and i'd include sort of lnd and talent so and what seats would they be then? That. operations person yeah, so like heads of operation, yeah. heads of marketing, um, heads of talent, heads of L and D, mm -hmm. things like that. Yeah, so that would um, be like the non-sales. Yeah, and then how? Obviously, you said you implemented a hierarchy. A hierarchy. Mm. What What does that actually look like? So I think you said to me what you've got at the moment. You've got what three three sixty managers and then one delivery manager. Is that how it is? Yeah, that's how it is at the moment. Um, how are you thinking about that? Are you thinking? Have you thought about right? We're only going <coughs> to aim to have five to six people to one manager. Or I don't know, how are you thinking about the hierarchy of the actual sales team? We're thinking that we're going to hire a lot of grads um, over the summer. And there is a hell of a lot of work for those guys to do, quite honestly. Like they're going to they're gonna be given a, a, a lot of opportunity. And they're great guys and they're going to rise to that, hopefully. I'm sure yeah. they will. Um, and hopefully the people that are in that kind of what we would call a kind of senior level. So like sort of 18 months, two years, hopefully those guys over the next year or so will progress to a point where we can sort of start looking at them for sort of junior management roles. I think like that, that billing management phase is, is probably one of the hardest things you can do in recruitment. Like mm. I know certainly in my sort of first, probably like, you know, year or, or so at that level years and years ago, like it, I definitely struggled. It's really, really hard. So we really want to support those guys as much as possible. Not like you know completely wrap them in cotton wool but like mm. it's like give them an, an enough sort of support and help and stuff so that, you know they can um they can develop and, and get better without it being completely overwhelming for them i think you can probably sales manage up to i guess directly maybe sort of eight ten people i think beyond that it's going to be it's going to be like pretty challenging and you're going to struggle to do your own business on top of that so and what what's top of mind to obviously these people are clearly absolutely fundamental and important to uh growing your business and getting to the scale you want to i've lost count of the amount of recruitment owners that i've spoken to that know who those people are uh but oftentimes leave so what have we uh, yeah what how are we thinking about making sure those people that are clearly fundamental to your uh plans how are we thinking about retaining them making sure that they don't end up in a position where they've got more stress they're earning less money Mm. Like how are you thinking about that? Because that's probably just as important. Yeah, I, I mean, I think just communication with them. Like, mm. just find out. Like, regularly checking in with them. Like, where where are you at? How are you finding things? And making sure that they have a route to earning more money year on year. If money's, like, the key driver for them. For a lot of them, it might be, like, opportunities, like, going and opening another office. But mm. making sure that that roadmap's clear to them. And if they're unhappy, I think Sean and I are generally pretty good at, like, saying to people, just tell us what you're thinking. Like, mm. if there's an issue, 
I'm not guaranteeing I can solve it, but it's better that you communicate it so at least we both know sort of where we stand with stuff. So I think as long as people feel like they're heard and mm. they they can affect change, I think that's a frustration for a lot of people. It, it's earnings, but it's also, am I able to affect change in my own environment? And if they can't, they're like, well, I'll just go to a new environment. Mm. I think that's, that's interesting. So what, what, do, what, do you, um, what do you think were some of the, like, as I said to you at the start of this, a lot of people struggle to get to where you guys are now. What were some of the biggest barriers or things that you've already mentioned that uh, getting some of the non-sales people took longer than you anticipated? Mm. Was there any other barriers that you found just took a bit longer to get over than you anticipated, or maybe on the sales side, or I don't know, was there anything else that... I'll tell you one thing I think that, uh, and this maybe goes back to a mistake actually that we made, I don't think, or I think it took us too long to empower other people in the company to step up into these roles that they're now assuming. And a lot of the time they would wait for like guidance for us rather than us empowering them to make the calls on stuff that they probably already knew how mm. we would react to stuff. And so that was probably something that we didn't do that we're now super hot on in terms of making sure that these people feel comfortable owning certain components of like the job, whether it be like a culture or standards or doing some training and stuff like that. I think we're much better now at empowering people to do that. And was that because it was just a very flat and you had just become accustomed to doing things and saying, yeah, we do this or we do that. That's how we do that. I, I, I think it's like on us uh, as like with, with a lot of these sort of things, I think we didn't communicate it to them. Yeah. And so they just assumed that it wasn't, you know, for them to do that. or didn't mm. maybe want to, um, like go above their their station or anything like that. And so when Sean was talking about it, it was a less of a flat structure. So it was basically just Sean and I managing those people. We're now trying to empower more people to sort of step up. And those people who are in those management roles are now in a position where they're starting to get people that are hopefully progressing into management. So they will effectively be moving into managing managers at mm -hmm. some point. And so that's how you can make it a bit more scalable. So when Sean said you can you know effectively manage 10 people, you can manage more people but not directly because then you'll have seniors, principals, stuff within your team that are then taking ownership of other members of that effective cost cost center. Yeah. And was it difficult? Because I speak to a lot of uh, recruitment companies who are at that stage and they'd probably describe themselves like you did in terms of we're on the tools or in the business, we're doing all that. How did, like, was that a difficult period for either of you? Obviously, Zeph, it sounds like you're a bit more still in that, leading by the front, you're, you're managing managers or helping inspire leaders these things but did either of you find it difficult to stop being that the the person who's on the tools who's doing deals like was that a difficult period or did you find that hard to do um i think we all when when we set up we always wanted to like try and lead from the front a little bit to mm -hmm. set standards um and i i think that there's there's, there's definitely a lot of recruitment managers I've seen over the years who have probably got off the tools a little bit too early. There's probably a, a, there's probably an, an equal share of people that have been on the tools too long. So mm. finding that like that that sort of sweet spot is is quite tricky. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I it has does anyone ever nail it? I don't know. How did you approach it? Was you like right? Did you like? Did you just start handing over clients? Did you just slowly? But yeah, how did you actually? I think over time, like and, and most clients will, I, I get sometimes you'll have clients for years and years and years and years and years, and, and you hope so. But like over time, some clients will sort of fade out. So I guess it's just around like the levels of BD that we do. I mean, me and Zeth haven't done any BD for years, like two or three mm. years. Like a, a lot of it is just sort of existing relationships and stuff. Um, but I guess now we're starting to pass newer stuff over, or even some of the existing stuff over as well, just because from a time management perspective, we just don't have the, mm. the capacity to to kind of do it. I think we've set we've set a bar of um of, of standards which is like hopefully quite good and hope, mm. hopefully it's something for people to aspire to i think that's that's enough um i don't think you need to do it absolutely every single year and i think actually if we d if we were to continue to try and do it every single year it would probably detract from what else we were doing you know we we, j we spent especially when the market was good like we spent a lot of time just working in the business you know like the delivery guys were working you know quite heavily for us and you know there was a, there was a lot of business to be done that was great but like the flip side of that is, you know, how much time did we think about like what's going on in people's heads, you know, mm. like speaking to other managers, like working on the business, you know, how are people really feeling? Is everyone happy because they're just doing loads of deals or are there frustrations, you know, is there sort of stuff like under the surface? And there were that we probably missed a little bit because we were in kind it, of, yeah. you know, in it too much. I think, and I think just in terms of like the mechanics, because I think I would have, 
liked to have understood this better if I was three years ago. I think basically the, the way that we did it and we made like errors along the way was to, to sort of phase it. So like at the start, it was obviously when we were doing the billing management role, effectively, we were doing BD, we were sourcing our own candidates. We then started moving to a point where we only did like the BD and managing the client relationships. Right. And then to the point where we just didn't do BD and we just worked with, with clients we already had. And that way it was sort of like, it was a phased, mm. like, a phased like lifting of responsibilities and that slowly fed more time into being on the business than in the business yeah that, that's helpful and did you like communicate to people that's what you were doing or that yeah you? yeah like I, I i was i was pretty early on in terms of like working with the delivery guys and then trying to upskill them in terms of rather than just doing a sourcing the candidates and managing the candidate profile doing some like account management and stuff and mm -hmm. like they would come to me with oh well, i don't know what to do with this i'm like Ask, <laughs> go back, speak to the client. This is how you would frame it, and then they would do it, and then they get more comfortable doing it, and then they're able to help upskill other people, and so they can do a true two seventy role. Then this podcast is proudly partnered with Vincherry, the all in one recruitment agency software that over twenty thousand recruiters trust daily. We're also partnered with the award winning One Up Sales, the sales and motivation platform that enables you to maximize the potential of your teams. We love partnering with both of these organizations because they share our mission in helping you get the most out of your people and your business. You can get exclusive offers because you listen to this podcast and get up to 10% off the usage price forever. Use the link in the show notes to get your hands on that. Let's get back to the episode. Got you. How curious, how, because uh, when I was listening back to our last conversation, I sort of described uh, you guys having a team of, delivery consultants something that i didn't hear a whole lot of but i'd say that's become super super popular particularly when obviously it was absolutely crazy how fundamental has the delivery team been for you to get to where you are now do you think yeah super important I, like i've always said it's like our like the engine room as in like the the when when the delivery team's firing it frees up the 360 guys just to sort of focus on their own market and so all the other stuff that they're generating on the side should get picked up by delivery and i think mm. the upskilling of a delivery team makes an enormous difference to the quality of service you're able to give your clients because you're able to like stick to that five-day turnaround mm. on cvs and there are multiple points of contacts for clients so if someone's on holiday they already or they're already dealing with a delivery consultant so there's two points of contacts and stuff for someone to reach out to so i think it's super important mm. so that was quite key let, let's break this down a bit because I, th I think this will be helpful for people because, like, I don't know how you're thinking about it. It's clearly been part of your business plan, like, throughout um, the majority of the time. But uh, I think particularly for uh, recruitment companies that are smaller, when I've spoken to them over the last, like, three to six months, the idea of having people in the business that aren't capable of, capable of winning their own clients is just something that uh, they don't feel overly great about uh, and I think every person I spoke to recently recruiter wise who maybe has been I don't know let go or if I'm speaking to a rec to rec and I'm saying how how are you finding the market most recruitment owners are going yeah we want people who have 360 experience mm. so like it'd be good just to because you you've done it for a, a lot of time clearly learned a lot so just firstly, so what is the actual split in your company right now in terms of like the um, the three sixty team to delivery team? Like, what? How many people in the three six in the three sixty team compared to the delivery team? It's probably a, a third, about about a third is delivery. This is something we battle with on yeah. a weekly basis. Yeah. What's that? This the ratio of like how many delivery people you have to how many three sixty. So people. what's the current ratio then? It's about a third delivery, two thirds three sixty. Yeah. So out of your entire like consultant sales um, force, whatever you call it, two, uh, one third of them is delivery. About that, yeah. And then how? So just and then how have you set it up? And then I want to ask you questions on like maybe if you were to start a delivery function tomorrow, how you'd approach it. But like, so how do they support the entire team? Uh, yeah. the other two thirds. Yeah, they do. So like a, a lot of the or the vo uh, the majority of the volume used to come from Sean and I and a couple of the senior guys, whereas now it's thrown open to like. Pretty much any, any of the guys. So we, the delivery manager would effectively do a delivery meet with his team just to sort of check in where are you at with your your boxing off of this mm -hmm. job and that job. And uh, he would then speak to, previously it would have been Sean and I, right. around like coordinating what, what the next wave of jobs looks like. But these days, Sean and I have tried to step back from that and said reach out to the 
individual managers of the 360 mm. guys directly and find out you know what's the job flow like on their team so it now runs autonomously without us okay uh, we were super involved in it so let, let's just talk about uh this for a for a second then so um like I, I guess let me just start like if like knowing what you know now if you were to uh start a delivery function from scratch tomorrow what would the first 90 days look like Oof. Okay, so like are you, a similar business model to us in terms of hiring, just training. Just like, yeah, like just because I think uh, this is something I think often grown recruitment companies think about, mm. but then they're worried about are we going to have these people on quite high bases that aren't capable of winning business? I don't know, yeah, I think there's there's things that a lot of people are concerned or worried about. Okay, so I, I, I would get somebody who was your strongest person at delivering roles, right? So if you evaluate your whole business, Who's the person that you know does a great job of like account managing and runs a super tight ship, like super tight process in terms of delivering against jobs? That person could, in theory, effectively head up that function. Okay. When you're hiring grads, those grads would then go into that function and this person would teach them the process. But that process needs to be tight. Like we used to have, we used to absolutely rinse me all the time because I used to have like sheets for everything. I'm like, look, this is, this is the process. Follow this process. Make it simple, like so that people can follow and they're new to the job. That person would effectively upskill. So the sort, sorry, just put cut in there. Sorry. So this, as in the process for when I give you a job, this is what you do. Yeah. So post it on LinkedIn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do this. All right. The actual process of step yeah, yeah. by step, what you do to source for a yeah, job. Yeah, yeah. So okay. like, and, and ideally, you don't even have to get through like you get the job covered off without having to go through like I don't know, looking at GitHub forks or weird right, yeah, yeah. shit like that. So it's like go on the database. Yeah, yeah search yeah. for this. Okay, cool. Yeah, sorry, yeah, cool. To put that in. Yeah, so they, they would effectively follow that process. That person would be effectively the manager of that function and would teach new people, effectively trainees, whether it be grads or whatever. And and generally these people, I, I, it's not always the case, but the people who we've always found have done really well at um, delivery are those people who who take pride in like attention to detail yeah. and have a nice process and they're like they like structure and stuff like that and gen generally those sort of people do quite well so when you're hiring and stuff we would often start interviewing and saying mm, i think that person is really well suited to delivery because they seem to have that more sort of delivery mindset so i would try and start thinking about that when those people then join they obviously join that that delivery manager that manager would basically be making sure that they were working at the same sort of standard as as you were and just start drip feeding jobs in right over time Particularly if you've got like a sales guy who's like super super good at like generating jobs, you know you have that 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 salesperson who just hates doing delivery. They hate sourcing profiles. If but they're really good at generating jobs, we just let them do that and get some like the delivery people just to start working those jobs in the background. It then just becomes scalable from there because the more people that understand the process, the easier uh, the easier other people will learn it just through osmosis, mm. proximity learning, just being around those people. Okay, cool. Right, a couple of questions then. Firstly, like, uh, I know it will evolve over time, but how involved are they in the process? So do they source it, qualify the candidate, then hand it over? Do they do the qualification, interview prep? Like, what does that look like? Yeah, so I think, like, when they first start, it's very much just a 90 degree. Yeah. So you basically just maybe source candidates and stuff. Those candidates would then go over to the 360 person. That 360 person would probably still qualify that candidate and then manage that process. When they probably get to consultant, um, now they're doing... A full 180 job so in theory no one talks to like or the 360 person won't talk to the candidates and they will still be involved in some of the client stuff but maybe not the more difficult stuff when they go to like senior principal level they're probably at the level there where they can take specs and like effectively run a whole process outside of the initial generation they wouldn't agree terms, terms. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah they wouldn't get yeah. the client on yeah they would take an intake call do all that and then close candidates yeah. all of that Okay, cool. And then what does a what does a good look like? What are the, some of the key metrics that you measure people against quite early on as a go? Are you looking at, I don't know, um, CV to interview ratios? It, like what are the sort of key metrics? So we push uh, delivery on 10 CVs to clients like per week. Okay. So the CVs will go to the 360 consultant. They will either say, yeah, they're good or no, they're not. But I think we push them on 10 CVs per week. The thought process behind that is, if they're doing 10 CVs per, uh, uh, per week, they're working two jobs per week. Mm -hmm. The SLA says five days, but we try and target the guys to do it in two and a half, or they know that it, maybe it rolls on, they work two at the same time, morning and afternoon, yeah. to break it up a bit. And that would be 40 CVs per month. In theory, they work eight jobs. If they work eight jobs, they're probably going to be placing about three to four of them per month. Okay. Uh, talk to me about, and then I know what people will think, oh, wait, I think you've broken that down really well. Thank you for sharing that. Commission, what are we saying? 
How have you structured that? It might have evolved over time. How have you... Because typically, I've found that when I speak to people, the 360 commission is better than the delivery commission. How have you done that? Because they're not bringing on the client and how have you approached that? Mm. So... It's very <laughs> topical, actually. Yeah, it is. Actually. <laughs> we just, we've, we've not just long, changed We're it. just not going to change it. I'll let Sean go through that if you want. Um, so we... Uh, originally, we had a, a sort of flat fee structure, which... Ra- so when Zeth's talking about, like, the consultant, senior consultant, principal consultant thing, like, basically, the more responsibility they have in, as a delivery person, the higher commission they get per placement. Got <laughs> Um We had a lot of feedback over, um, I guess, like, last summer and stuff around, like, some of the... Um, delivery people who are maybe um, a bit unhappy and it's a bit of a weird one because actually like you know these are people that have probably been in recruitment for like a year or two or something like that and they're earning reasonable money you know they're earning sort of like 40 50 60k sometimes stuff like that and you know which at the the time they came in for an interview they probably would have been pretty happy with but the problem is that there was a huge discrepancy between the delivery guys and the 360 guys and you know we had 360 guys who were you know, a handful of, or, or a f- fair few of them who have only been in recruitment for, you know, like a couple of years, two, three years, earning sort of, you know, 150, 200 grand a year. And, and because there's such a, mm-hmm. a difference between the two teams, that was basically just like, just pissing them off a little bit, quite frankly. So so we did a big, like, deep dive into it and, um, and, and changed the model a little bit to bring the two commissions um, a bit more in line, basically, split the value of the deals. What we found, our, our deal values, average deal values have, have gone up, um, just consistently really over mm. the years and you know when when we originally designed the initial commission structure you know it was it was it was pretty good it was pretty fair to to the delivery guys but what we it was a flat fee yeah but and and you could you know you can roughly work out as a percentage but it was um, it was with an annual bonus as well yeah so, oh yeah oh yeah i remember you saying last yeah, time yeah, that yeah, yeah. They get an annual bonus. yeah 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 but um what what we see what we've seen is that the the guys have um we've been able to do some really really good high value business um which is great but obviously with flat fee commission then the deliv- delivery guys weren't seeing the upside on those deals so mm. it, ha- it had to change um so what, have you changed it to a percentage or? yeah change percentage yeah, the exact percentage but like so what is that do they have you done it so then what they get an agreed percentage of the overall annual salary, basically. Yeah, you so, so you just split the fee. So, so say the fee is like, you know, 30 grand or whatever, then, you know, maybe, um, you know, 20, 30%, whatever, something like that might go to the delivery person. Um, and then the rest of it will be allocated towards the 360 person. And then, then that goes through our commission scheme. Right, okay, yeah. So like, the, I get what you mean. So there's basically, you've just split the pot, basically. Exactly. Yeah, so like based on the fee, the percentage, yeah. some, one percentage goes to delivery, the rest go to sort of 360 and on the average deal sizes it was it's probably about the same as what it was before but for the larger deals they get actually they get the rewarded they, they get that. the upside plus they'll get the upside on the multiple deals as well so that the the over performers the overachievers will be more heavily rewarded just like they would be on 360 because that wasn't really happening quite as much okay, so yeah, they're, 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 they're yeah. also incentivized as well and the same with the 360 guys are too um like bundle starters so like to to encourage like consistency obviously the more stars you're gonna have in a month the higher you're up the commission band you yes yeah, so you have like banding whereas stuff. before it was just flat so flat, it, it, right, it, it yeah. doesn't make a difference whether they had like an absolute knockout quarter and then did nothing the yeah quarter how um d- uh how how fundamental is the delivery function going to be to you getting to 60 heads yeah as i think as as important as it's always been i think the the split of you know uh, at our peak a couple of years ago, we were 50-50 delivery in 360, really? which I think, you know, and it, it, for most people now, they, most directors will probably listen to that and be like, and think that's probably super high. But at the time, it was operating like really, really well. Um, but when, especially when you get people that are, what for that to work, you need people to pull a lot of jobs, obviously, right? So, but as me and Zeth have sort of come away from the tools a little bit and, and the market sort of softened a little bit, then you know, that balance has to probably be redressed a little bit, So, w- which we've already done. Mm. Um, it will still be a crucial component to the business, but I guess, like, yeah, developing, like most people you said you were talking to, they only want people that can that can bring fees in. I think for us, we, we probably want most people to be able to do that, but there's still a place for people who aren't always, well, that's not naturally going to suit them as well. Mm. I think this is one of the reasons why we why it's been successful is that there's a, there's a home for those people. You know, maybe they don't want to go out there and do like the, the proper sort of hardcore BD stuff and, and everything else. Some people love that, some people don't. But for the people that don't, then, okay, like, is there still a role for them? Can they still be successful at Plexus and like yeah. have a good career and stuff? And like, yeah, they can, you know. So yeah, no, that's the uh, the upside, isn't it? Because if yeah. you don't have something like that, and you're like, I absolutely hate BD or I'm shit at it. Yeah. 
you then you yeah you're a failure or there's nowhere else for you to go but it works the other way around as well right because you get you and like i said you need people that are, are bd machines for sure and and the, uh, you know probably the best recruiters do fall into that category the best 360 recruiters so and you want to be able to support that because probably those guys they don't really want to do loads and loads and loads of delivery and actually it's going to like eat into their time loads you know they go and pull mm. 10 jobs and they're like oh god i forgot those jobs so, so let's just talk about that then because again clearly this is fundamental to you guys scaling and how you've got to this point let's on the flip side then when we say 360 obviously typically people would perceive that that they manage the whole process right but what it sounds like is they're mainly focused on just pulling jobs sales side so what what are the expectations of these people who have a massive powerful resource in this delivery team mm. what are the what are your expectations of them is it just are they mainly just focusing on yeah market mapping building their patch um, bringing on a jobs, whatever. Like, what are the expectations of the people that aren't in the delivery function? Then, because you're calling them 360, but it doesn't sound like they are. Yeah, it's a good question. I, I mean, three, 360 should be able to do 360, obviously, like as 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 the name implies. But yeah, I guess the reality is that the the, the uh, certainly for the people that are higher up that. So we want the. I guess one of the most important people that we want to support at the moment is that kind of middle management team, right? Yeah. So if you're a if you're an early stage like billing manager, you've been in a job for like two, three, four years. You're learning the ropes. You're probably managing like two, three, four people or something like that. What you're going to find is that your biggest challenge is time management. Yeah. So to be able to support that, then we try and give those guys the the more experienced delivery people and the most access to those delivery people right. to free up their time a little bit. So those guys probably are. I guess they, they'll probably fall more into that like BD camp. They'll probably be offloading a higher percentage of their jobs. The more tra- the more trainee 360 people will probably be working more of those Go jobs themselves. Tackle. And certainly with the jobs within their own patch, we don't like super strictly lock people into sort of certain patches but we do we do suggest and ask them to, to focus on sort of certain areas so some people might do like front end or they might do ux or, or whatever and really for jobs in their in their patch they should definitely definitely be working their own jobs really on 360 up to you know sort of management level stuff outside of their patch maybe there's more of an argument to, to pass those jobs over to delivery so that it doesn't detract from you know they're mm. going off and speaking to different types of people yeah. and and that sort of soaking up their time that's really interesting actually that that makes sense because they're absolutely fundamental for you guys to grow they're often the people that are the most time poor as that as you're putting more people underneath them mm-hmm. so obviously one of the so if i'm in that seat obviously and i speak to these people all the time the highest leverage one of the highest leverage activities they can do besides coaching their team and helping their team is winning business and that could be for their team to work on a lot of the time but what you're doing is uh helping these people um yeah by giving them make sure they've got a really good resource and support from the delivery function so yep. they can still do that and then there's a very high chance that they're still going to be able to be making the money that they were because they've got that resource yeah and like when you talked earlier on about like how are we supporting people who are in that position because like i guess most recruitment directors fear is that at a point they're going to lose all their top performers and their top yeah. and, all, and all that sort of stuff but I suppose for us, why I'm, I'm not as concerned with that is because they've got a, a, an amazing opportunity. It's super supported by the delivery team. They're supported yeah. by us and, and everything so else. So they're spending time on like the sales side and then they've got more time then to coach, to exactly. support the team because they're they're leveraging the, the delivery team. Yeah, exactly. That, that, that's, that's super interesting, to be fair. Um, so what what's like, is there anything else then that's... Um, top of mind going into the, this next phase then because i'm sure you're thinking about it a lot we've spoken a lot about <coughs> i think you've done a really good job of sharing some of the things you double down on uh to get to this point the delivery function how you approach growing the team what what's really top of mind we've spoken about the non the non-billing stuff and, and those seats but what else for you guys now is really top of mind to get to this this next phase so uh, i think it's creating the infrastructure and the support structure for the business that we have in five years. Mm. So that is a lot of the stuff around like the training, internal hiring, marketing, operations, but also sales management. And so while we, we know that we're going to keep on hiring and we are super conscious of the amount of people that our sales managers are going to have to try and manage and stuff. And so how do we how do we go about supporting them? Is it that it, I don't think it's necessarily a solution that Sean and I go back to individually managing sales managers, but mm. do we start going to market to try and find other managers to try and support so that it isn't a, a big, uh, yeah. such a big time sponge for these people. Also, I think like looking at the second wave of people that we have in the business and and how we can accelerate their route to management as well. The back office stuff, the marketing stuff and the talent stuff, I think are 
stuff that we maybe traditionally neglected or we've done it but we haven't done it early enough mm. and so basically building all of that stuff so that when we are x number of people in the future we have all of the 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 function ready to support that mm. obviously this is all stuff that you wouldn't have a fucking clue about doing recruitment <laughs> do you know what i mean still don't yeah so like how how are you approaching that because like a lot of those things that you just very much like i don't know learning as you go asking for help because yeah. you know you guys were top performers great recruiters obviously let's be honest up until a certain point you was pretty much that but then leading the team leading by the front managing a lot of the stuff that you've probably become comfortable with obviously sean i feel like you've got a bit more of the short scroll doing things maybe more of the things <laughs> out of your comfort zone on the off side compared to zeph but all those things you just said there it's like proper business stuff isn't it it's yeah. not fucking doing deals and yeah. all that anymore is it so how <coughs> how are you approaching that because there's a lot of things that you're you're not going to be good at to start with that yeah. I, t I tell you what it is right this is like i i think we're generally both quite good at just discussing this sort of stuff and thinking does that make sense i don't think it makes sense don't do it or yeah it makes sense we'll do it i think like i think we're not the amount of times like we've interviewed people that work in these other areas particularly if i'm interviewing an ops person i'm sort of just going in there like cool what am i gonna ask this person i don't really know <laughs> i don't really know what to ask him or likewise like how do you interview a marketing yeah, person marketing. when you're not a marketer mm. like you can ask him like you know what are your blind spots what do you think you're really good at what do you think you're really bad at but like is that a good answer mm. like, I, I don't know i think like you have to just lean on other people so like i think both of us speak to a lot of external people like mates of ours mm. and ask them what they think and how they're doing it we, like sean said we brought in a, an interim cmo because we knew we needed to get marketing right because we want to try and like because our market is global we need a global reach and mm. while you can have people like reaching out over the phone it's not gonna be as strong as it is digitally but you know we just don't know what good looks like in a marketing person yeah they seem sound they seem like a cultural fit but are they a good marketer so mm. i think just reaching out to people and just leaning on uh, maybe experts in other fields and just being like yo help me out here. i've got no idea what i'm doing mm. with this what do you think have you, have you not considered? I think like, have you not considered uh, like an NED or strategic advisor at this stage? Yeah, we have, we have. What's been, what's been the vibes? Not not really enjoying who you're speaking uh, to. Not no, 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 no. We've spoken to some like some super smart people, like, and they they've sort of shared some some really really good advice. I think it's like really hard to try and find the right sort of NED at the right time for you and understand. It, what does this person's value right now versus in three years or what what are the problems we're dealing with right now and who solves those problems right now because i think if you speak to any ned they'll obviously say to you yeah i can help you right now but actually they're probably of more value two years ago or they're of more value right. three years from now so just trying to sort of find the right ned for you for the problems that you think you have mm. but i'm sure they probably will tell you you know you have sort of other problems that you don't know about <laughs> So you haven't been convinced. Yeah. No, it's not it's not that we spoke to some great people. And and I'm sure at some point we will start to I mean this the the person that we have as an interim CMO is effectively an advisor. Yeah, basically. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And I think that, that I think the likelihood is we probably look at something like that for finance as well. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. And he's not a recruiter as well. That's probably a good thing. Yeah, it's just different perspective, isn't it? Mm. Mm. So how how are you uh, both thinking about uh, remaining uh, or having continuing to have a competitive advantage in this um, in this marketplace? Then I'm sure it's something that you think about. Like I, I can only imagine, although obviously it sounds like it's it's a real difficult period and it has been for a while. But more and more recruitment companies are going to be, you know, entering the space. How do we feel about uh, continuing to have a competitive advantage or remaining to have a competitive advantage? How are you thinking about that? I think <laughs> yeah, how's it? Yeah, on, I, I think um, <laughs> we talk about it a lot. We do <laughs> talk about it a lot. I, I think one of the things with crypto, right, is that naturally it attracts people who are like, you know, pretty skeptical, pretty cynical. You know, it's like the whole don't trust verify thing, like part of the technology. People kind of take that approach to, to kind of who they work with as well. So I think the advantage that we've got is because we were, you know, one of the first people in the space and we've been around for a, you know, quite a while. I guess we've got a decent ish moat because of that. Mm. Um, you know, it's not just like obviously the, the candidate network and stuff like that is obviously is obviously helpful. Um, but I think I think the brand is is pretty strong. I think that that 
helps a lot. I think that there's a lot of tech recruiters out there who have like tried to do a little bit of crypto, and you know, I'm sure they'll like pick up a few jobs and stuff like that. But I think if you, you know, the only way to do the space is to immerse yourself in it. You got to like, you got to live and breathe it every single day. Um, mm. Otherwise, the people are just a bit, they'll probably just be a bit skeptical of you. So I'm going to ask you where where we want to be then before we uh, finish and and another three to five years time whatever time horizon you've been thinking about. But I guess let's just end on as as we said in preparing for this. Someone who's listened to this right now who is yeah at that 15 head mark really is ambitious to get to that 30 head mark, uh, but is finding it difficult. Maybe yo yoing from 20 back to 18, back to 15, whatever. Sean, I come to you first. What what's like the yeah, the one bit of advice or the two bits of advice that's top of mind for you to help that founder entrepreneur who's just really struggling to scale past that 15 to 20 head mark? Um, you got to think longer term than you're perhaps thinking. I think a, a lot of the time, like especially when you're setting a business up, people are just going to want to try and deal with the problems in front of their face a lot of the time. And they're mm. probably thinking about, you know, like what, how are we going to do deals next month and what's our pipeline like for the next three months and stuff like that. But actually, you've got to think, where do I want to be in like maybe two-ish years, something like that. People talk about five-year plans, and I think like that's most of those are just bullshit, just dreams basically. Like if you're talking about a, a, an actual strategy, an actual plan, you know, try and forecast forward maybe a year or two or something like that. Think about and then think about what you need to get there now and build build the infrastructure for that now. Yeah, nice. So take a step back and expand the. Try and do your best to expand how far ahead you're looking. Nice. Yeah. Seth, what you got for us, mate? I think like be comfortable with who you are and like have a vision for what you want to be and make sure people feel part of that. So it's not a, this is what I want to do. This mm. is what we want to do. And this is why I think we should do it. And and I think I would also say probably just because it's an error that we made, like get comfortable with empowering people in your business because the more you empower people, the more they will be loyal because they feel like they are more part of it than just uh, another person in that company. Probably those two things. Nice. I think what you're saying about, like, be proud of, like, doing it in a certain way, that's been absolutely massive for us. Like, there's a million different ways to do recruitment. There's lots of different types of companies and different areas of, you know, like recruitment or whatever, and they do things in different ways and they have different structures and they're set up in different ways and whatever. Like, for us, it was like, this is how we do it. It works really well. If you don't like it, that's cool. Don't worry about it. We're not going to change. We're going to stick our flag in this hill and it's, it kind of works for us. And actually, ha and that just, it, it, that internal kind of branding has worked really, really effectively for us. Mm. So I would say do that. Find out who you are and just like stick to it, basically. So next three years then, where, where are we going to be? Let's end on that. Let's go. Three years. This, uh, this is where you come out with outrageous statements. And next three years. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to be. What's the GP goal next three years? Oh God. Um, Roughly. I'd I'd uh, I'd like I'd like to get to eight figures. Mm. I think I think that's definitely achievable. Um, we're moving into this office in the summer, which will hold maybe ninety, maybe a hundred people, or something like that, which is mm. you know pretty cool. Stroke terrifying at the same time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, we really want to do the US. Um, it's been on the sort of long-term radar for a while and uh, and uh, we've got the visas and stuff to do that and, and hopefully next year we'll, we'll get that off the ground. So I think if we can do that, then um, make that work and mm. you know, make the UK operation tick over like it has, then yeah, I think definitely like uh, eight figures GP is, is on the table for sure. Let's go. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I think, I think <laughs> like we, like I, I, I think like the, the, the stuff in the States, we have to do it. Like we've got like a visa, we're ready to go, I think. And I think maybe not even just the States. I'd maybe like to at least be starting to plan maybe other places, other locations. So it's dictated by the people we've got. Mm. Like if someone says to me, yeah, I want to go and do this and this is what I want to do it, then we start building a plan for that. Mm. Boy, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, see you, see you in three <laughs> years, mate. <laughs>